What's going on guys, this is Rob, and as you guys know, I am a big fan of the Wolverine comics when they're talking about old school stuff, because I'm an old school Wolverine fan. The new school stuff isn't terrible, it's just, I'm kind of a hipster in that way, right? I, I feel a little dirty when I say that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm kind of an old school fan in that way. So picking up here with Wolverine volume two, uh, technically volume two is like issues eight through 12, but they're two distinctly different stories. And so I'm really calling issues eight through 10 volume two, and then 11 and 12 kind of wrap around to the first story dealing with the vampires, which uh, which I'll call volume three, right? We'll kind of call it a day. But the cool thing about this is that in the, the last video that we did, we talked about how Wolverine had kind of forged a friendship with Jeff Bannister in the sense that Jeff Bannister is a CIA operative, and this was exceedingly important, right? For a couple different reasons. One, because of the fact that Wolverine's always been a guy who kind of knows what people to network with, what people to hang out with. And a lot of that's just because of his history, his experience. And two, because regarding Krakoa, one of the big things that we know is that Krakoa is not really on the list of a lot of people in terms of friends, right? The idea of mutants around the world just consolidating into a singular nation. And the fact that Krakoa has really kind of propped itself up under ultimatums and, and kind of bribing society to a degree, right? Offering medicines that only they can provide. And in a lot of ways, undercutting a lot of major corporations. Because politicians are usually owned by major corporations, that in turn creates a scenario whereby Krakoa is now shunned by governments because for the most part, corporations don't like them. And for the most part, a giant nation of, of mutants really just presents an existential threat to humanity as a whole. And so having someone like Jeff Bannister on his side is one of these instances where, sure, there's the official communication channels that Krakoa has set up, but what Wolverine's got his own unofficial channels, the guys that can give him information that maybe those official channels for Krakoa simply just can't do. And so what the, what kind of goes on is there's a bit of a discussion in terms of their own histories, the kind of mistakes they've made, the kind of things they've done, because they both have a pretty dark past. In the case of Jeff Bannister, there was an instance when he was new to being in the military, right? He had just kind of enlisted, and it was one of those things where he had bought into the propaganda, right? We as the US military are the good guys, whoever we send you against are the bad guys, and that's it. And their job was to take out a convoy who of course, they'd been told were basically bad guys. Come to find out what was actually going on is that in the middle of this war, what you had was basically this convoy filled with Americans who were actually traveling to the opposition to essentially end the conflict. And that Jeff Bannister and his guys being sent in to take out that convoy was to ensure the war didn't end. That way the military industrial complex could keep on going. And so the result of this is he's like, you know, we literally kept the war machine going by killing our own soldiers. Now I'm not in the US military. I don't really know if that happens, but a part of me has to believe that it does. And a part of me almost kind of feels like it'd be naive to believe that it doesn't happen. But the important thing here is that Wolverine asks him, you know, even after all that, you still work for the CIA, right? You're still a spook. Like if you're a CIA spy, why are you still working for them knowing all this is going on? And the response of Jeff Bannister is because I'm trying to keep things like that from happening again. He can only do so much, but there is a bit of merit there. Now, of course, he kind of has to work within the lines, right? Work within his, his role, his place. But having made contact contacts, networking, different things like that. It allows him a, a kind of communication, at least a series of communication channels that wouldn't be readily available to him had he left the CIA. And so following that, he kind of asks Wolverine, what's your whole story here? And this is when you start to get this kind of secret history of Wolverine. And in fact, we get it on and off over the course of this, this story, which is really, really cool. But what this does is it actually picks up with Team X. Now, for those of you guys who don't know about Team X, Team X was amazing. So this was a concept that I actually didn't become aware of until I started reading X-Men Volume 2. Once I started going back and reading old comics, then I started learning more about Team X. But at the time when I was like 11 years old, I didn't know that I had to go and read other comics to understand what was going on in the comics that I was reading right then, right? So the, the long and short of this with Team X is this was initially the entryway into the Weapon X project, not conventionally. What I mean here is that Team X was basically kind of like a Black Ops wet work team that was an extension of the CIA, but it was a plausible deniability thing, right? Like if some Something happened to them, if they were caught, then they would just be totally disavowed by the CIA. They'd say, we have no knowledge of these guys. As far as we're aware, they're mercenaries working for some unnamed person out there. We have no idea what's going on, right? It'd be able to be very easy for the CIA to just cut bait and bail, right? As that, that was the whole role that Team X played. Now, secretly, and what Team X didn't know is they were actually an extension of a, a kind of joint venture between the United States CIA 
and Canada's Department H. And so because Team X was so effective, what had happened is they were rolled into the 10th iteration of the 10th project of Weapons Plus, also known as Weapon X. And that's why it is that Wolverine's healing factor was bonded to Maverick. That's why Sabretooth, Wolverine, Maverick, all these guys were basically brought in and turned into what were basically the Weapon X project, had their minds wiped, sent on missions, different things like that. To a degree, it's already kind of happening. It's just not something that was made readily available until after their tenure with Team X. But it's one of these things where they talk about how the kind of missions they'd done and the kind of things they'd been engaged in, they had actually gone onto a, to an oil platform and basically took it out, right? It was one of the biggest oil platforms in the world. And they did that because of course, that was their assignment. Behind the scenes, it was one corporation paying to eliminate another corporation. And that was basically it. But there were thousands of people on this platform who died. But at the time, he didn't really care. Over the years, as things have changed and he's basically experienced more and more stuff and kind of lived more of a life, he's come to terms with a lot of these things that he did and really gained a bit of that human side. But during these days of Team X, when his mind was being wiped, he was being used as part of uh, as part of Weapon X. Honestly, that was never part of the equation, right? His mind would be wiped. He'd be basically given a series of false memories that would basically fall in line with the mission that he was going on to ensure its success because he would have a personal stake in it. And then he would achieve his mission. Everything would be done. He'd go back, have his mind wiped again, right? It was just part and parcel, just kind of rinse and repeat over and over and over again. And so what you actually end up finding out here is that Jeff Bannister basically tells him, look, I know you guys have a lot of people out there that are gunning for you, but something you need to know, there's some group out there that calls themselves the X desk and they're part of the CIA. More so than that, they're behind the scenes of behind the scenes in the CIA, right? Like most people in the CIA don't even know they're there. The fact that I was even able to get a name is kind of astounding, but they're gunning for you. We don't know what they're gonna do. We don't know what their motivation is, but the CIA has it out for the nation of Krakoa. And that just makes good sense, right? The Central Intelligence Agency is ideally supposed to deal with foreign threats, while the FBI and the NSA deal with domestic threats. But the important thing here is that when it comes to the CIA in terms of how they view Krakoa, because Krakoa represents an existential threat to humanity, it would only make sense the CIA would create some kind of task force that would serve the purpose of monitoring the mutant population. So what you end up doing here is basically switching to Utah to what's only basically described as some kind of US government black site. And you've basically got these guys that just kind of roll in there. They end up taking a handful of these guys out. And then in turn, they snatch up some dog tags, one of which belonged to Logan. And then they basically bail out after gaining some further information. And that's basically it, right? We don't really know what their motivation is. We don't know what it is that they're specifically looking for. We simply just know that they're there. But whoever they are, they were able to overcome some pretty heavy hitters, right? These guys are experts in stealth and espionage, the whole nine yards, because as most of you guys can probably imagine, breaking into a US government black site and taking out everybody there and then getting information and leaving, that's no small thing, right? That's a little bigger than like stealing information from Facebook servers or hacking Twitch. <laughs> it's kind of a big thing, right? And so what we end up doing here is switching to the point in Krakoa, right? Now, for those of you guys who don't know, the point is kind of like the intelligence hub, right? That's usually where Sage operates. But if, if Krakoa had its own like CIA, the point is where it would be located. What ends up happening here is that with Sage and Beast calling Wolverine in, that what we end up finding out is that the nation of Krakoa is basically involved with this break-in essentially at the uh, US government black site in Utah. And the reason why is that while this would normally never involve Krakoa, that what they did is they attained blood samples. And in fact, they were contacted by the CIA to bring somebody in. And the reality of this is the blood sample basically belongs or seems to belong to Agent Zero, also known as David North, also known as Maverick. Now, Maverick is a great character. In all honesty, most modern day readers probably won't care about Christopher Nord. That's one of the other names he uses. He uses all kinds of different aliases. And even by his own admission, he doesn't really know which name is his. We know it's Christopher Nord. <laughs> but one of the things here is that he is OG, right? Honestly, if you really wanted to get into Maverick, you'd have to go and read some old X-Men stuff, right? Really X-Men volume two, if you want like the high octane, fast paced stories involving Team X. But it's one of these things where where Christopher Nord and Wolverine have a pretty sketchy history together, right? I mean, they were all part of, of Weapons Plus and, uh, and Weapon X, right? So they have that kind of history there, but more so than that, they've kind of been on again, off again enemies for a variety of different reasons. But the big question here is what's going on with Maverick and why would he orchestrate a break-in into a CIA black site? And so following that, you switch over to LA to basically Dazzler's house. And what ends up happening here is that as soon as all these mercs basically break in, of course, that's what they're being referred to as the mercs. Once they break in there, of course, they're met with the entirety of her, her alarm system, which is basically just like 
these sonic dogs, right? Just emit like these crazy sounds that basically almost shatter their eardrums. Well, Rain shows up, manages to get a hold of one of these guys and then drags him off. And what you end up having here is him basically interrogating it, right? He realizes this guy's name is Crosby. And that's when he asks the question, what's going on? Where's Maverick? Because if you guys are doing this, Maverick has to be behind it. He has to be the one orchestrating all of this. Why is Maverick breaking in to government black sites and stealing artifacts and things like that that belong to the mutant population? What's the goal here? And so what you end up finding out is that in the aftermath of the rise of Krakoa, what you ended up getting is a giant kind of ramping down of the military industrial complex as opposed to years past. And the reason why is because in the aftermath of Krakoa rising, suddenly these conflicts between the United States and the Middle East, or these conflicts between North and South Korea or things like that started becoming less and less important because again, the rise of the mutant population under the banner of a singular nation represented an existential threat to the entirety of humanity. So while I wouldn't say this is some kind of Star Trek-esque situation where war, disease, and famine are all basically gone and humanity's been united in a way that was never thought possible, while that's certainly not the case and that never will be in Marvel Comics or here in the real world, what is going on here is even if only momentarily, a lot of humanity are ramping back their, their spending on conflicts and amping up their spending on intelligence, all because they want to know what's going on in Krakoa. <laughs> that's how big of an issue Krakoa is. And that's what this guy says, that with the military industrial complex ramping down and a lot of conflicts coming to an end, there really wasn't a whole lot of a whole lot to do out there when it came to these, these soldiers, right? That for one reason or another, everybody was either bored and hungry for action or they were dissatisfied with how they were treated and thought they'd be better off in the private sector. And so while this guy kind of reveals a little bit of this information and says like, all we know is that we're carrying out jobs for a place called Legacy House. We don't really know what's going on there. All we know is we've been contracted for that. Like we're mercenaries. We're paid to perform tasks that require military action. Before he can really divulge any action or any information, this guy's shot in the head, taken out just like that. And so what it does is it switches over to Wolverine, basically being dressed up by Sage and Beast and being sent to Madripoor. Now here's the thing about Madripoor. We've talked about Madripoor before. I love this place. Nobody knows how to navigate Madripoor better than Wolverine. This guy's best suited for it. He spent so much much time in this place, but Madripoor is one of those places where everybody minds their own business, right? Madripoor, when you're in Madripoor, you follow a very specific rule. You didn't see anything because you weren't there. And if you were there, well, you still didn't see anything because you were asleep. Everybody minds their business. Everybody just kind of does their own thing. No one snitches or rats on anybody else. It's very much a lawless place. And so when he gets to Legacy House, of course, he says, I'm looking for some company, he kind of goes through the normal routine that you go through in Madripoor, because even in Madripoor itself, there is a kind of custom, right? A sort of decorum that has to be abided by when it comes to stuff, because there are some things that go on here, even for Madripoor are pretty shady. And so what he says is like, I'm I'm actually looking for, for room 13. That's where I hear all the action is, right? And that's what she says, like 400,000, you know, currency for Madripoor bot is basically what you got to pay to get into room 13. And that's where an auction is being held. And so what you end up finding out as this auction goes on is Wolverine sort of muses about his own life on his way there. There, he talks about the time when everything began to change for him. And there was a point where they ended up taking out or going on this mission and that they were, you know, essentially killing all these people. But unlike Wolverine or Maverick or anybody else on Team X, Victor Creed relished what it was that he was doing. The idea of Wolverine was we just need to take these targets out. We don't really need to torture them or anything like that. For Victor Creed, that was part of the fun. He loved engaging in torture. He loved engaging and and just kind of, you know, screwing people up in the most physical ways possible. Now, this is something that we'd already kind of known known from Wolverine's history, whether you go and you read uh, X-Men Volume 2 or you go back and you read some of the early stuff that kind of mentions Team X to a degree, what little tidbits that you do get in the early history of Wolverine. But one of the big things that led to Wolverine leaving in those comics and it's kind of being rehashed here is that this is where things changed because he stopped seeing himself as somebody who was a weapon, somebody who was basically a tool to be used to achieve a goal and started seeing himself as somebody that, hey, like we have, like we're, we're people, right? We have hearts, minds, souls, all that kind of stuff. You know, we're we're not just here to torture and inflict as much harm as we possibly can. And so following that, that's really what sort of led into the early defection of Wolverine involving Team X. When you looked at guys like Mastodon and so on and so forth, him basically leaving and, and kind of bailing out, that's what led, really sort of began all this stuff. Now, again, this is what really also went into Wolverine and the rest of the team being snatched up and thrown into Weapon X and then basically going forward as Weapon X team members and then Wolverine ultimately escaping after having adamantium bonded to his body and all that kind of good stuff. You guys pretty much know all that history.
history there, but it's a really cool and really insightful thing for him. And so once he actually gets into this place, once he gets into the, the actual auction room itself, something I want you guys to notice, everybody's here, right? You got members of the right who are staunchly anti-mutant, right? Just like ultra right wing conservative crazy guys. You've got the Kingpin, you've got the Verindi, right? So the, the remade version of the Hellfire Club. You got all kinds of people here. And that's the nature of Madripoor. One of the things that also goes on is that when it comes to the Legacy House auctions, it's not necessarily what you would expect. It's not really always this thing of, hey guys, we captured Deadpool, we're gonna auction him off. Or it's not really like, hey guys, we have a sample of Wolverine's healing factor, so we're gonna auction that off. Or we're going to auction off some vibranium from Wakanda. It's not always that way. Instead, a lot of times it's just artifacts, history. So there are people who were here as much for just the historical value of the things they can buy as they're here for actual worthwhile things that can be weaponized and used for various campaigns that they have going on. It's an awesome concept. And so once the whole thing kicks off, we get a really good idea of what this auction house looks like when you find out that one, you've got a cyanide tooth that belonged to Black Widow at one point in time, a prison painting made by Jigsaw. Of course, he's one of the most notable, if not the most notable villains of, uh, of Frank Castle. You've got a goblin glider that belonged to the Green Goblin that was taken at some point, the cowl of Captain America, which he had when he was thought out in Avengers number four and then released. Of course, he switched his outfit later on. This original one is the one that he was wearing when he was initially frozen at the end of World War II, the gloves of Magnetic Man, the gravestone of Spider-Man when Peter Parker basically died. And then also he basically reveals that one of the big things they have here is the severed hand of Wolverine. Now this throws Wolverine for a loop, right? Because the first question he asks here is, how in the hell do they get a severed hand from me? My hand's right here. And so immediately this starts to hit to the idea that there might be some kind of irregularity with the resurrection protocols, that some event took place where Wolverine's hand was basically removed, he ended up losing it, he was resurrected, and then that portion of his memory was removed. So that basically Krakoa is in some ways doing exactly what Weapon X did, which is modifying the memory of Wolverine. And if that's true, that totally destroys any trust Wolverine would have for Krakoa, he would likely bail out and start doing his own thing. That's one thing to know, is that Wolverine's trust and his loyalty to people always walks a knife's edge. The smallest slight, the smallest betrayal, and he's gone forever. You'll probably never see him again. Not only that, he's actually given a tissue by the Kingpin to kind of, you know, wipe his hands and, and kind of keep himself cleaned up a little bit. And of course, drops it on the ground and somebody picks it up. They sort of carry it away. And so from there, this auction guy basically says like, look, like the big thing that we have here is Maverick, right? This mutant known as Maverick. Now, under any normal circumstance, this wouldn't matter, right? I mean, Maverick is cool. He's capable. I mean, he's got some margin of a healing factor. It's nowhere near Wolverine's, but it's still relatively capable. He can absorb kinetic energy, turn it into concussive energy. I mean, the guy is great in terms of being like an assassin or something like that. The real kicker here, and the reason why he's auctioning for such a high number, right? Like $150 million, so on and so forth, is because he's a mutant. And so having Maverick on your side basically gives you the keys to the kingdom. Maverick can pass through Kokoan gates. And so in effect, you could have your own spy. He's been totally mind wiped, right? So he has no knowledge of his own history or anything like that. But whoever it is that wins the auction would basically get their hands on Maverick. They could use him and say, go into Krakoa, stay there for a few months and then report back and tell me what's going on. This is huge because you would have, you have a lot of people who are gonna be competing for this, not just criminals, not just Kingpin or somebody like that. Entire nations would be vying for something like this. And so what you end up finding out is that with this tissue having been picked up and it basically being analyzed, they end up discovering that it's actually Wolverine. And that's when basically this information is just kind of blown out all over the place. So they're like, hey guys, so Wolverine's here. Uh, he's part of the auction now, right? Everybody get him. And of course these numbers skyrocket, $300 million and, and so on and so forth, right? It's insane. The gloves of Magnetic Man are used by the auctioneer to basically ensnare Wolverine because again, his bones are made of adamantium or at least laced in adamantium. And then following that, you kind of have this brief little memory where Maverick had basically rescued Wolverine or at least helped Wolverine in the midst of all this following the events of his involvement in Weapon X. And one of the things he says is he says, listen to me carefully, today is a victory over yourself of yesterday. And he keeps just, he just keeps telling him that, right? As these two are sitting in these cells as part of Weapon X, he keeps telling him that, right? Like today is a victory over yourself of yesterday, kind of helping to remind him. This is important because what this does is it ties into the idea. This is one of the reasons why Wolverine was able to escape his confinement during Weapon X is that where his mind was being wiped, he was always reminding himself of who he really was, that he was not some kind of an agent for Weapon X, that he could find a way to break out to escape that kind of a thing. And so that's what he keeps telling Maverick and it's enough 
for Maverick to basically regain his bearings and then all hell pops off, right? All hell breaks loose. Like literally Wolverine and Maverick are just like, let's get out of here, man. So like they start shooting the place up, right? They, they, I mean, they just start like shooting the whole place up. The auctioneer pulls out a handgun that belonged to Frank Castle at one point, shoots Maverick across the face, but it's not enough to actually, you know, kill him. It's just enough to injure him. And he's like, hey man, I'll take that injury, dude. The injuries help. <laughs> and so these guys just basically start killing everybody. Like henchmen are coming in left and right and they're just slashing people all over the place, right? Just tearing these guys bit by bit. In the middle of it all, you end up having this woman who was previously watching the conversation between Jeff Bannister and Wolverine and basically says, Okay, cool. She takes the hand of Wolverine and then sends in all these, these uh, CIA operatives. And then of course you find out her name is Special Agent Ramirez. And basically their job is to take down Wolverine and Maverick. Now the whole thing behind this is these guys are ready, right? When you're talking about regular foot soldiers in Madripoor, it's guys with guns, right? There really isn't a whole lot doing there. But when you're talking about CIA operatives who are part of the X desk, who are specifically tasked with taking down mutants, they're more than enough to contend with. And that's why you basically at this point have Maverick and Wolverine who just bail out as fast as they possibly can and get out of there where they can. And by this point, they're just running through Madripoor and just fleeing for their life, shooting back at those guys. Those guys are shooting back at them. And again, just like you always expect in Madripoor, everybody's minding their own business, right? It's, it's, it is, it is a place where you can do what you need to do without having to worry about people snitch on you, right? And so just because of the fact that if you're discovered to be a snitch in Madripoor, they'll kill you, right? They'll, well, they'll probably torture you first and then they'll kill you, right? They'll just throw you into the ocean or something along those lines. But of course, this basically leads to Maverick having his own murder Merck's crew basically rescue him and Wolverine, and of course they escape. All the while, uh, Special Agent Ramirez is just watching this whole thing go down. So once they end up escaping, it's a, kind of a cool little situation. Wolverine is very much at home here with these Mercs. It's very reminiscent to his days in Team X and his days during Weapon X when it was him and Maverick and so on and so forth. There was a kind of bond, a sort of camaraderie, almost like a brotherhood of sorts that was formed there, if for no other reason than all the missions they went on and all the things they did together. And so where initially Wolverine's very, very hesitant to be a part of the Mercs. He's kind of told by Maverick, look, you can join us. And he kind of starts entertaining the possibility a little bit. Now, ultimately they end up traveling to what's basically the safe house for uh, for Legacy House, which is where like all these artifacts belonging to the mutant population. And it's not even just them, right? It's the X-Men, it's Advanced Idea Mechanics, Hydra, the Fantastic Four, Shield, the whole nine yards, right? All these things that have just been taken over the years, whether it's because of conflicts that unfolded because they just sort of keep them around, whatever the case is, right? Things they just kind of snatched up that were just sort of laid there after the, the end of a massive event, they're all taken and they're all auctioned off to people for a variety of reasons. But all of it's basically torched. All of it's essentially destroyed. And so again, at that point, you end up having Wolverine who brings Maverick to Krakoa. And that's when he kind of shows him what Krakoa is like. The reality of this is that Maverick's not comfortable here. One of the things to know is that Maverick sort of continued on where Wolverine stopped. That when Wolverine kind of found a home among the X-Men back in Giant Size X-Men number one, when he joined the X-Men team, that never really happened with Maverick. Maverick always kind of stayed on his own. He always did his own thing. And that's what he tells Wolverine. Like, look, man, you know, I'm not really down with this. You know, when Wolverine says like, look, we can remake you, right? We can, well, I mean, basically you'll have to kill yourself, but like the five can resurrect you <laughs> and they can make you Maverick like you used to be. The response of Maverick is no. Like if, if the last few days have taught you anything, it's that I don't want to go digging around in the past. Who I am now is who I am. And I'm fine with who I am. I'm fine with my Mercs. I'm fine being where I am. They're not really family, right? It's not, not a thing where like he'll go to the ends of the earth for his mercs. At the end of the day, he's paying them for a job. And if they die, he'll replace them with more. That's just kind of how he sees things. At the end of the day, when it comes to Maverick, it's just Maverick, right? Everywhere he goes, there he is. He's really the only one he actually really ever cares about. And so when he kind of extends this to Wolverine, he's like, look, man, I've got everything I need, right? I've got everything I need with my mercs or with my, my organization, my business, my whole nine yards. If you ever want to come join the mercs, hit me up, right? And that's when Wolverine says, well, if you ever change your mind, come and find me. So the door is kind of always open, right? The offer is always there. And so what you end up doing is switching over to New York when you have Maverick showing up at a coffee shop and sitting down with Special Agent Ramirez. And what basically seems to be going on here is that because Maverick is a mercenary and that means his loyalties are to whoever it is is paying him the most, because Special Agent Ramirez seems to be paying him a whole bunch of money or possibly because of the fact that he's always been an agent for Special Agent Ramirez. And maybe it's one of these things where this whole situation was set up for no reason than to gain the trust of 
of Wolverine again and then find a way into Krakoa so he can report back that basically he's working with the CIA. Whether or not he's going to spill the goods on Krakoa to kind of serve as a spy in Krakoa and report back to the CIA on everything that's going on, we don't know. But what it looks like here is there's a wolf in the hen house. That's really what it looks like. <laughs> but with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this to an end. Thank you guys for watching and I will catch you all later. Peace.